Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Welcome to today's event with Risha Wade and Langston Khan. Risha Wade holds a BA in Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity from Stanford University and an MA in Religious Studies from the University of Chicago. She has served as a hospice and palliative care end of life caregiver in Los Angeles County. She has supported people through grief and transitions as a birth doula and lay ordained Buddhist chaplain working in jails, on the mother and baby units of hospitals and in people's homes. She is the author of Grieving While Black, which has garnered praise from Roshi Joan Halifax, Halifax among others. Langston Khan, is a black queer shamanic practitioner specializing in emotional clearing and radical transformation and the author of the new book deep liberation shamanic tools for reclaiming wholeness in a culture of trauma which has garnered praise from bio Kamalafe, among others his practice is rooted in initiations into traditions of the african diaspora the western modality of interrelationship focusing the contemporary shamanic tradition of the last mass center he joyfully endeavors to bring spirituality of the dark, dusty recesses of esotericism and into our daily existence. It's an honor to welcome you both, Risha Wade and Langston Khan. Thank you so much, Jacob. Thank you. It's so good to be here with you, Risha. I'm so excited to get a chance to speak with you. Me too. It's nice to finally meet virtually given that we can't connect in person. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed reading your book um, during a time when I was moving through my own personal grief of losing a family member, but also just this time of so much collective grief that I think, you know, is always there to some extent, but right now is perhaps made more visible than usual. And your, your, your book is such a good hold such a strong container for weaving together that interrelationship between uh, the personal and collective experience of grief and how that relates to our everyday life. So I really appreciate all the work that you've done. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, I would love to hear a bit about if you could speak more to your personal journey with grief. I'm so fascinated by the way your work has included tending grief in relationship to new parents with incarcerated populations and um, people navigating the transition into death and the end of their life. And I would just love to hear more about what led you to center grief in your work in this way. Um, Yeah, thank you for your feedback on the work. I know um, given the work that you do and um, your book, you're also familiar with what it means to move through grief and trauma um, and what it means to hold that within one's body and spirit. Um, And you, you know, are working with specific practices to help people heal through that. Um, Whereas for me, uh, in my book, I walk through more of the... um, I focus specifically on the emotional, mental unpacking <laughs> of what this means uh, and the consequences. And then you, you know, you take that and you uh, talk about specific ways that uh, we can heal that. But for me and how I got into this personally, um, you know, I grew up in South Carolina, 
Um, I moved around quite a bit, um, but uh, moved around, you know, in Maryland and then Southern California prior to going to college in the Bay. Um, but in general, um, you know, just being in South Carolina and witnessing grief and um, experiencing complex trauma within my own family of origin um, and trying to make sense of those stories and similar to what you've done, um, weaving together different practices um, in order to really uh, make sense of what it meant to, or it means to be a black woman uh, in the bed of that type of grief and trauma, right? Uh, so there's that type of grief that um, I experienced directly. Um, and then there are the types of grief that um, I didn't really recognize as grief as I moved on to different, um, to different parts of my life. Like, for example, getting into Stanford was like a dream that I had since I was like seven, right? Um, and even though that this was a, an incredibly exciting and promising moment for me, uh, within all that excitement was still a lot of grief, you know, um, because that was a transition from the way that I knew life um, and, and walking into the possibility of what life could be um, through this new situation. There's also the grief of, you know, walking into a PWI, um, you know, predominantly white <laughs> institution, uh, being myself, <laughs> you know, woman, black, uh, queer, uh, and what that means to to move through that space in my body and just feeling the grief of generations. Um, so I would say that, you know, that's a lot about my background and, and my connections to grief and then taking that knowledge um, and, and the healing work that I've done um, over the years into situations like the mother baby units, like, you know, being a doula um, and just being very attentive to where grief is present. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I love how in sharing your personal background, you really touch on how grief isn't just about loss of something from the past that you explain a lot in your book really beautifully. And, and it's also about these kind of larger passages and transitions and expressions. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about your definition of grief itself. Yeah. Um... So the way that I explore grief in the book is um, expanding it beyond concrete loss and beyond past losses, which is usually what people think of when they think about grief. Um, and I'm going to, you know, tie that into how people think about grief in terms of blackness and racism too, right? Um, but usually people are thinking about something that's already happened. So a lot of uh, folks I've worked with as clients um, or even people I just, you know, um, ran into via the hospital and whatnot, you know, they're if their life is great, you know, maybe both their parents are still together, they never even lost a pet, you know, their grandparents are still alive, you know, the job is popping, relationships are cool, everything's Gucci, you know, um, they don't feel they have anything to grieve. And at the same time, these people, um, despite how good their life is in the moment, they're afraid of losing everything that they currently have. Um, you know, they're struggling for promotions, um, you know, they're afraid that their partner might leave them maybe, or, you know, that people might see them as a quote unquote fraud. And that is a type of grief um, that I, you know, call fear of loss um, that we don't readily talk about. You know, it's a type of grief that's related to the future. Um, so instead of grief being this like line that only points backwards, I like to look at it as a circle that's all encompassing because we're always moving through transitions. And whenever there's transitions or impermanence, uh, which is what we call it in Buddhism, you know, the state of change, there's always that sort of loss. Mm, I love that. Yeah, I love so much about how you talk about time in the book. And that so fits with some of my own understandings of both grief and what it is to be in a state of health in terms of being part of this living process of all of life and able to respond to that living process versus sort of limiting those potential through the stories we carry from the past. And so I, I love that idea of fear of loss as a type of grief. And I wonder if you could talk about how that fear of loss might cause people to have difficulty navigating these big transitions that you support people through in terms of birth and death and, and how grief factors into those transitions from your perspective. Absolutely. Um, so whenever people fear something, especially when they don't recognize they fear something, then they are driven by it, right? Um, so when we're talking about fear of loss, when people don't recognize that they are fearing loss and that grief is operating in their lives, that means that that grief is 
has them in its grips and they don't even know it and they're fighting against a force that they can't identify. And when they aren't able to identify it, not only does it cause harm against themselves, but against everyone around. Um, so, you know, what I notice in, you know, end of life care or, you know, uh, in birth work is people are constantly resisting, not just the transition that's ahead of them. So for birth, it's, you know, presumably excitement, um, though, uh, interestingly, the way I inadvertently got into end of life care was through attending a birth where the baby didn't make it. Um, and that just, you know, led to a windy path down <laughs> end of life care. Um, so there's this anticipation and this hope of this, you know, exciting thing, right? Um, this, this birth, this new life, um, that there can also be um, a resistance or different types of resistance that people, A, don't feel comfortable naming or B, don't recognize. You know, you're not supposed to feel grief or you're not supposed to feel quote unquote negative emotions, which is what people think of when they think of grief during this happy moment. Um, and when it comes to end of life, you know, there's of course the, the actual end of life, the death is a big D that people are afraid of, but then there are all sorts of other things that come along with it. Like, you know, if you're the person dying, how am I family be without me. If you are the family member losing someone, you know, what will my life be without this person? You know, what will this mean for me, me financially? What will this mean for me um, in terms of my identity? You know, there isn't just a love loss, but maybe I will now see, uh, maybe I'll now be a an orphan. You know, I don't have parents anymore. Um, so there are all these other complex losses that um, people are frequently subconsciously fighting against. And Within the book, you know, I, I talk about these very specific circumstances because these are like circumstances where people can think of grief um, or readily identify grief. But this is, these forces are working in our day-to-day -day lives on a regular basis, right? Um, and when it comes to, to grief and, and Blackness, usually, you know, what people think about is the grief that Black people experience as a result of systemic racism. Um, but what I focus on using these examples of, you know, where people can identify grief, um, I use that, you know, as an example or as a way to lead people into recognizing grief where it, it may not be readily apparent, specifically the ways that white people experience grief it, just through existing and their relationship to fear of loss and how their unexplored relationship to grief and fear of loss leads to Black people, <laughs> you know, experiencing um, excessive grief and fear of loss, and that just perpetuates systemic oppression. Mm, yeah, you articulated that so, so beautifully, and that definitely touches on some of my own experience. I've seen, um, you know, sometimes working with white folks who want to engage more um, in an anti-racist framework or, or from a social justice standpoint. And what's a big block for them is actually not being willing to really feel what they might be losing if they were willing to step into that world that was more just than which each person actually got to experience liberation, you know, in that world. Like it's, and so if they can move into that grief, then they can begin to feel into that deeper longing beyond mm -hmm. their current comforts that can pull them out of that bubble into reality, you know, where the rest of us in a sense, not that we don't all have those various bubbles to different extents, but I so, I so appreciate how clearly you helped um, us to see these ways grief can show up so then we can engage tools to actually move it and not just let it become that poison in our heart that's keeping us from being in that flow of time you were talking about before mm -hmm. and, and enacting that denial on by denying others pain or inflicting our pain on others, kind of outsourcing it. So I'd love to hear if you could talk a little bit about some of the tools or, or practices that you find most useful when someone is in that state where they're not quite aware of of their grief but they know there's something that's not moving they know that like grief is necessary but they're wanting help to bridge into that experience of, of navigating their grief more fully yeah um so in my book i talk about mindfulness and meditation being a tool um that isn't just you you know meant to be appropriated for relaxation but it's really meant to be um, a tool to help ground us in our awareness and, and the reality of our own suffering so that we, A, um, 
don't impede other people <laughs> who are, you know, moving through their suffering so that, you know, other people can, um, can heal and navigate their suffering and also to, to facilitate, um, you know, our ability to, to show up, to, to serve others, right? Um, so that's mainly my focus um, within, within my book, like using mindfulness as a tool of awareness and, and as a tool of self-healing. Um, but in terms of what practices would you recommend? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I love, I love that delineation you make between mindfulness as a tool for comfort, which just sort of reinforces the status quo versus mindfulness to resource us to move into the discomfort and sort of peer beneath the surface of things into our own actual inner life. Um, I think that's a really important point that not enough people make when they're talking about things about mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, for me, one of the biggest tools I've engaged around grief is ritual. Um, really creating community containers for people to work with things like elemental forces like fire and the earth to sort of bring grief up into expression and then release it into the earth. Um, not, to, not to move into that sort of linear model of grief, it's just something to like be felt and released and then it's gone, but as a, as a way to let grief empty us out a bit so we can feel what's beneath that fear and denial you were talking about of loss, either from the past or in the future. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I was giving you that look earlier when you were talking about, you know, the, some of the white folks you work with who feel that resistance um, mm -hmm. and are unable to, you know, move through their own grief. And, and then it has that downstream effect. I was like, child, I got some stories. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to share I'm some? I'm so glad. Okay. I was like, mm. <laughs> well <laughs> yeah um, is that something that you come across in your work frequently or is that just from moving moving through through the world you know that's I would say both you know it's it's something that I think as as a black person as a queer person you're going to encounter inevitably you know yeah. um and a, because I do work as you said people um helping them to sort of track trauma to the roots in their bodies and because I do emphasize that I'm mostly interested in working pe with people who are not just engaging transformational work to be more comfortable, but actually to have the resilience to move in the discomfort needed to create change. I, I get people asking those questions often. Yeah. But now I'm very happy that I have your book to refer them to. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, yeah, when you when you made that comment earlier, uh, can I share a story with you? Yeah, please do. I'd love that. <laughs> so I was thinking about, uh, what was this? It was just like two weeks ago, right? Um, so I was at my allergist and, and asthma specialist just getting my allergy shot, right? Um, and while I was there, like normally I don't see any other Black people there because of where the place is located. Um, but this time I saw um, another Black woman, which is great. Um, and we were all you know, kind of like social distance outside waiting to go into the office. And, you know, I could tell sis was having a day, you know, <laughs> like something's going on. Um, and, you know, finally we are right beside each other and um, she's waiting to speak to one of the nurses uh, because she's checking in. I'm trying to make my appointment. And the nurse kept, I guess the nurse kept confusing her with some other Black person because, like I said, not many of us are there <laughs> that often and you know this black woman let's call her uh, Tanisha was very upset um so you know the first time Tanisha corrected her um and then the nurse has called her Amanda Amanda called her this black person again and then Tanisha was upset um and then Amanda did it again you know it's like you know Amanda didn't know what to do and just kept tripping over herself um and Anisha, uh, Tanisha was just like look, this is a lot, you know, it's in the middle of the workday, I have other stuff going on, and you keep calling me, everybody except who I am, and I just want to make my appointment, and Tanisha is just like, you don't have to keep apologizing, because Amanda was apologizing profusely, at one point, Amanda even looked over Tanisha's shoulder and called me some other Black person, and then thought that I was Tanisha's daughter, <laughs> and it was just like, oh, it just kept getting worse and worse, but um, and Tanisha was like, clearly had reached a point where she was just fed up and, and was lit and made a comment suggesting she was going to leave a poor review. And the nurse kind of, Amanda just kind of froze and was sitting at her computer and we didn't know what was going on. Like there was no progress. Nobody's getting checked in. Our appointments weren't getting made. And all of a sudden, like she starts getting teary. 
And then Tanisha looks up and she's like, oh my God, are you crying right now? Um, and Amanda just started bawling and she got up and she's like, you know, I can't do this. And then she goes and speaks to the other white nurses and has them come over. And then Tanisha was just fed up and just went to sit down. She's like, I just, I just want to make my appointment. Um, I go up, I do what I have to do. Um, and <laughs> then I get to my car and I just sat there and I, I reflected on that entire encounter, um, uh, where, you know, Amanda, probably living through 2020 or living in 2020 or 2021 understands that confusing black people is a bad thing right and she probably understood that she caused offense to Tanisha and to me and that it was hurtful um and then she didn't know where to go from there she just felt shame about being this quote-unquote bad white person um and because no one if she hadn't moved through her own relationship to grief and accountability all she could do in that moment was cry and abandon accountability uh, and leave us in a situation in this all white office where we were then stuck holding the bag of what had transpired. Like not only were we stuck with the grief of what had happened, um, but we were also stuck with the feeling of being, feeling like we're bad, bad people, we're the angry black women, having all the white people look at us, like, what did you do? Why is this, why is this poor nurse crying, right? Um, and all we're trying to do is get our medical care taken care of. And I was looking at that situation and thinking through so many other situations, like in the hospital that I named, or just moving through my day-to-day -day life where, you know, white people's avoidance of, you know, impermanence and, and, and ability to recognize how fear of loss is functioning in their lives. Um, and through that inability, inability, you know, not being able to, to work with their relationship to grief um, has a downstream relationship where we as Black people are holding the bag of that grief. Just like in the office, we are standing there just wanting to make our appointments, you know, <laughs> and we are left with the consequences of her grief and our own grief, you know? Yeah. Those situations are so hard because on one hand, as like a compassionate person, you want to be able to be there for another human being in their grief. On the other hand, that grief that they're feeling has nothing to do with you and is so outsized compared to what's actually happening in the moment. It's really not your responsibility to hold in that moment. So it's this horrible conflict. And I think one more way, you know, white supremacy damages both of us and our inability to show up for each other as adults and human beings you know and yeah thank you for sharing that story i guess uh, as i'm hearing you speak about this i wonder we've talked a bit about some of the challenges white folks have to engage in grief that intersects with racism and i'm curious if you could talk about some of the unique challenges you found that, that black women and black queer women specifically encounter when engaging their own grief yeah um so I specifically focus on um, how white supremacy makes it harder <laughs> for us to engage um, our grief as we are moving through the day today, um, right? So all of us have, have a relationship with impermanence. Um, and, you know, the way that we are able to interact with our grief and the consequences of not dealing with our grief varies depending on our social location um, and the harm that we can inflict by not, you know, sending to our grief theories, depending on our situation. So for Black women in particular, um, I, you know, talk about how our anger is often misunderstood and misrepresented. You know, the, the trope of the angry Black woman is often used as a way to further dehumanize us because it's, you know, divorced from the context that has created it. Um, and if you're talking about grief and stages, even though I personally don't believe that there are stages of grief, but I think that they're like expressions and representations, but you know, anger is an expression of grief. But it was it Elizabeth Cool? I, I forget her full last name, but like this is this is something we documented, right? <laughs> like, you know, anger is a stage of grief, but that's not how it's viewed when it's attached to Black women who are experiencing tremendous amounts of grief um, through what we move through every day. And I would say the same um, for LGBTQ people, or the queer Black people as well. Um, and for that, you know, really my call um, is that, you know, in order for us to actually heal as a people, as opposed to um, being reactive um, and simply, you know, finding ways to 
survive, <laughs> you know, um, white supremacy is really, um, it's really imperative uh, that white folks also attend to their relationship to grief so that we have space to actually move um, through this grief as it comes up and have an honest relationship with it, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, yeah, I guess talking about having space and anger, I wonder if you could share a bit more about the role you find that anger and boundaries play in that larger grieving process, like the function of that expression. Yeah, um, I think anger has a very powerful role in grief. I think um, because of systemic oppression, a lot of people, um, I'm thinking specifically in social justice circles, aren't given space to move outside of anger because anger can also be very tiring. Like, you know, it serves its purpose, but we're not meant to stay there <laughs> as people, right? Uh, just being in that space of, of anger all the time uh, makes it damn near impossible to heal um, because, you know, anger, I, I look at it kind of like adrenaline, like it, it serves its function. It can get stuff done. It can, you know, tell us when something isn't right. It can tell us when we have been sorely wounded, um, but we can't actually actualize healing from that place of anger and let's go get them um, at all times. Um, so yeah, I, I see it as a, a tool for identifying what's going on, as a tool for, um, you know, a, I see it as a source of movement, you know, shifting things in a different direction. Um, and, and in terms of, of grief and, and boundaries, actually I feel like those are two totally different questions. So I want to <laughs> answer the, the anger one first. That, that get to your question? Yeah, yeah, okay, thank cool. you for that. Um, and with the, yeah, definitely in my, in my own process, anger has been such a necessary medicine for my life that was really disowned for so long. Mm -hmm. um, so I really resonate with what you're saying because when I didn't have my own anger online because of ways I didn't want to enact the abuses I had seen in my environment myself by other men, um, that, that was still an abuse of power to give up my anger. You know, and so as I began to allow that part of me to come online again, I, I did have much more space to feel my own emotions, to feel my own grief and let them be moved into expression and release and be in that like, you know, healthy elemental flow of the emotions versus feeling more and more distant in the relationship between my body and my emotions. I really appreciate you sharing that. Um and making that distinction uh, because anger does get a bad rap, you know, like when I think about being a Buddhist, uh, Buddhist practitioner, like in Buddhism, I, I think it, I know in Christianity, I can't say for all religious traditions in general, but, you know, anger is kind of taboo, you know, anger isn't something you really want to feel, um, and, you know, in society, like we're taught in a lot of situations, whether it's within work or, or whatever is going on, that we have to stifle our anger, um, because anger, you know, even though it is a powerful, it can be a positive and transformative emotion when misused, that sucker <laughs> can be very dangerous. Um, and, you know, I totally understand um, the hesitation in a lot of these traditions to want to engage that anger. But like you said, you know, when we aren't given space to really reclaim that and, and engage it and learn how to interact with it in a healthy way it can be equally as damaging mm -hmm. and i know and i think for you know black folks in particular there's that real challenge of any expression of anger or even just the stepping into conflict can be perceived as an attack and then mm -hmm. or a threat in some way and so yeah, there's that extra challenge um and I guess within that, yeah, maybe you could talk about the next part of the question around how boundaries relate to, to grief and anger. Yeah. Um, so when I talk about grief as fear of loss, capitalism, society, relationship, everything is constantly manipulating our grief without us being aware of it, right? Um, so, and I, I want to tie this to boundaries specifically, but, you know, for example, within workplaces or even academia, how I hate this about academia, just having, just feeling like 
to be human or have boundaries is the worst thing ever. <laughs> <Right>? so, <laughs> So I need sleep. Oh my gosh, you need sleep. What's wrong with you? Just whatever. So, so, you know, so I, I think about, and I just, you know, used to work in tech or work in tech during the pandemic. Um, within, you know, professional situations, um, our grief is constantly being manipulated in order to have us, uh, have us weaken our boundaries for the goals of capitalism or whatever, you know, oppressive system is functioning. Um, so I use the example of sleep, um, but there, there's also, um, you know, the, the example of time, you know, the time we spend at work. There's also um, the example of our schedules and the amount of work that, you know, um, is given to us and whether or not we say no. Um, or whether or not we say um, no to to like whatever injustice we see going on at work, or you know, for the case of women who feel the need to wear makeup um, because they're going to be on camera for a meeting, <laughs> like you know, the the even if you know we don't want to wear makeup, we understand that if we aren't on camera, if we don't wear the makeup, um, then that might impact our ability to get the promotion that we want, right? Um, so we are constantly. Uh, incentivized to weaken our boundaries out of fear of what we might lose if we don't. You know, I might lose a promotion, I might lose a job, I might lose respect for my boss, I might lose the relationship with my coworkers who I'm with all the time, right? Um, and that ties into capitalism. Um, and, and then there, I want to stop there. <laughs> I was going to keep going, but I was like, that's enough for now. But in general, um, we are constantly feeling the tugs on our relationship to grief and fear of loss, even though um, for the most part, we don't recognize that it's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's so, I, I really appreciated some of your explorations of, like you were saying, the relationship between that pull and fear of loss and time and the ways that certain people in cultures of white supremacy will be sort of given the benefit of the doubt. Like you, you don't show up looking great for that meeting and it's, oh, they must have just had a hard day. Whereas yeah. the other person is unprofessional and needs to be like, let go, you know, right. soon. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's so big when you, and it, when I felt you were getting pulled into that larger conversation of, of the, that the way that, that time really gets um, colonized and manipulated in that way. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if, if that might be a good bridge to that larger part of the conversation you're feeling uh, around time and, and the hoarding of it and, and how that sort of gets in the way of our ability to really engage grief as a teacher it's, it's meant to be. Yeah. Um, capitalism and the structures around it, like white supremacy, sexism, like all of the other forms of systemic oppression that, that goes along with it to support it, they are all about hoarding resources. And one of the primary resources that it hoards is time. You know, I mean, it, even if you just want to do a simple math equation, <laughs> like, you know, it, 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 capitalism is about money. And then there's a saying that money equals time. Therefore, capitalism is also about time right um and one of the things that frequently gets stolen like I, I know we talk about the wage gap and the way that capitalism sells uh, women black people black women black LGBTQ people um short it is something that is documented um you know statistically but within that um and, and within so many other ways you know capitalism is consistently taking time away from women and, and people of color, such that we don't have the same opportunities or moments of joy with the people that we care about. We don't um, have the same opportunity to, to make meaning with our life because we, we don't have time. Um, we're obviously denied time at the, the hands of the police, okay? So like they're the concrete ways that we are denied time within these systems. Um, but then there are like the downstream effects, whether it's, you know, dealing with the stress of navigating these systems and, and developing high blood pressure and diabetes um, and, and having that, you know, not only impact our quality of life in the present, but time for us in the future. Um, and all of that happens so that people who are more privileged do have more time, 
you know, um, so I'm just going to go, you know, and say like straight white men who get paid more have more time. You know, they can pay for someone to co- pick up the kids. They can pay to live in this nice neighborhood. They can pay for Whole Foods <laughs> or for takeout, whatever they need. They can pay for the good doctor. Um, and then they don't have that stress and the downstream effects because that's passed on to someone else. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's just a, an intangible resource that has very physical consequences on um, the people on the margins who are taking the brunt of that grief so that people who are closer to the center of privilege can feel comfortable. Mm, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really sitting with that um, right now, not just the ways that systemically we're robbed of time, but also the ways that we then enact that same abuse on ourselves too mm-hmm. in, in our desire to survive, you know, or the, or the way even after we're past the point of survival, the sort of stories we carry that still keep us in those moments when we are struggling to survive. Um, I really, Ooh, you want to go, yeah. go deeper into that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, well, certainly like, you know, just, just reaching certain points in, in my um, practice where I noticed how the decisions I was making financially, the decisions I was making with how much, like the boundaries I had around my time and the, the ways I was accommodating others and, you know, sort of tending to their visions was more coming out of this fear for survival that wasn't my current reality, but was really rooted in some of my childhood experiences mm-hmm. and needing to become the adult that could show up for those parts of me still stuck in those experiences so that we could all get more free together and start actually responding to the current reality I was in as the current reality. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I think that's how all these, you know, systems function really because their systems are made up of people. And so it's, yeah, as long as we're not moving into our grief, like, like you said, then we get run by it. You know, we get run by what we're not being willing to bring into expression in, in harmful ways and in, in sort of patterns of self-sabotage. And we also are vulnerable to be manipulated by that system to keep playing a role in it. Um, and so I guess, you know, in, in that vein, you talk a lot about the distinction between the idea of salvation and the idea of liberation as sort of um, driving goals or, or per- pursuits in, in our life process, and I, or just as a collective movement. Um, and I wonder if you could speak more about that delineation. Yeah, um, thank you for sharing what you said just now, because I, yes, <laughs> 100% um, empathize. That's, I mean, and, and that's it all an ongoing process, you know? Um, so it's, especially, you know, now when I think about myself being married um, and what, what it means for me to still have those areas that I need to attend to while I have a relationship with someone else. So um, 100%, thank you for expressing that so so clearly. Um, yeah, uh, salvation versus liberation. So the thing about being trapped within our relationship to grief and hell and its grasp, which is what these systems of oppression ultimately attempt to do to keep us trapped, like in this moment and in this feeling such that we can't truly not only imagine, but experience anything outside of it. Um, You know, it keeps us relying on things that will save us in a given moment, um, but doesn't allow us to um, imagine true paths uh, of liberation. So an example would be, um, you know, being a woman um, who feels that covering up will keep you safe, right? Or, um, and, and that's something, you know, uh, respectability politics in, in the Black community. Um, so even though we experience quite a, a bit of police brutality and, or experience police brutality and understand that, hey, it doesn't matter if this boy was wearing a hoodie or if his pants were down to his knees, that's not a reason for you to antagonize and then to take his life, right? Um, and in that same uh, mindset, we could say, well, if she would, if she didn't want to be assaulted or she didn't want to be harmed, then she shouldn't have worn something so short. She shouldn't have worn something so uh, revealing. But ultimately, 
You know, this whole idea of, of respectability politics keeps us safe in these individual moments, or maybe, not even really, because, <laughs> I mean, people just be walking, Black men be walking down the street, minding their own business, women just be walk, walking down the street, minding their own business, and shit still happens, right? Um, so salvation calls for us to take on the burden of the grief of everyone around us for boundaries so that we might maybe are saved in an individual moment, but it doesn't allow us to truly imagine paths of liberation where we aren't responsible for the shit that everybody else doesn't want to claim as theirs, i.e. their grief. Um, and when we are stuck in that, that salvation mindset of, you know, if you go to college, if you speak a certain way, if you dress a certain way, if you don't have dreadlocks, and if you check all the boxes, then hey, maybe you have a chance <laughs> and thriving in white America. It doesn't allow us to, to actually embrace the fullness of our humanity for now and, and for future generations. Mm. I love that. I think those, that, those defining those two words in that way is so important. I've, you know, my own work, um, sometimes I work with ancestors, you know, those who have come before us and also the descendants, those who are coming next. And when I felt into sort of messages from the descendants of like what they were wanting to call out of us right now in this time, so often what I heard is exactly what you're articulating, that we don't want you to just be focusing on how do you survive this moment, but we want to bring the medicine of what comes after liberation in a sense, like, you know, what comes after you've already been in this joyous, continuous living process towards a world in which everyone gets to do what they've come here to do and we want to bring the medicine then because that's like the beginning that should be square one it shouldn't be this like mountain we have to climb to get there and so yeah i really appreciate your um way of delineating how easily it is can can be to get stuck in that salvation mindset not there's anything wrong with it but that if that's all we're in it's ultimately not going to create the change that allows us to be more purposeful in our lives to live a life that has more heart and meaning to us yeah um and it's it's really hard to break to break out of that because in order to experience liberation in this lifetime and not have liberation be something that is only in the afterlife you know we have to be alive and mm -hmm. to be alive we have to be saved but if you're trapped in a system that is constantly you know trying to snuff your life left and right i I, I understand, you know, why people choose salvation um, if it seems like that can buy you a couple of more moments um, of life. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's anything else you'd like to, to share before we open up to, to questions. Um, no, thank you. <laughs> this, is, this has been... Um, an awesome conversation. Yeah, it's been really wonderful to talk with you, Brisha. Well, it's been such an elevated and deep conversation. Um, I was really touched by this description of the all-encompassing grief that uh, Brisha described. Um, so there's a first question. Uh, Hoda asks, would you talk of the experience of being stuck as a symptom of grief? And how to transform it. Yeah, I feel like this is something we can both tackle it. <laughs> tackle. <laughs> so, um, and probably more Langston, uh, now I think about it, uh, in terms of the transformation of it. But uh, yeah, I would say that being stuck is, is absolutely an experience of grief. Um, you know, uh, the type of grief we talked about today um, within the, these systems are built to kind of keep us stuck. Um, and it's very difficult to, to move outside of that. And I know Langston does work around transforming that. Yeah, I mean, there's sort of different perspectives like Brisha was sharing around this sense of collective stuckness. Like, oh, why can't we change what we're doing together? Just being stuck in forces that feel larger than us, and also the very personal 
stuckness of our everyday life where we just get mired in something and we know that this heaviness in us or like grief feels like it's becoming this kind of poison in our heart that we can't quite engage or express but but we feel it present within us and for me in those moments um one as i was saying before it's really important to find ways of gathering around me community that is willing to hold my grief which is sometimes a tall order sometimes really hard in contemporary culture to find that um but holding that as an intention i think could be really helpful because sometimes we need a container that's bigger than just us to hold us so we can enter into that transformation and not be afraid of getting lost in it. Of like, you know, grieving so much, we'll never stop grieving. I think it's a common fear we have. We've been sort of holding ourselves outside of that place in us. Mm -hmm. And then within that, also being willing to let the, let the grief move in some way, whether that be through dance, through art, through weeping, through, you know, screaming into a pillow, if you're in like that anger expression or, or, you know, saying strong boundary statements in a mirror, but doing whatever you need to do to sort of physically move that substance of the grief so that you can begin to let the more spiritual, emotional aspects of it move as well and come into your awareness and, and engage with it a bit more. I'm tied with that's a question of, uh, you mentioned, uh, Lingson, you mentioned about ritual. What are some um, uh, successful rituals for individual grief and also collective grief? Um, so one very simple ritual that I've led uh, a number of times successfully, you know, publicly and personally and sort of online or in person is, is a ritual of working and, you know, of course, it's, it's complex to describe a ritual in like a few minutes. It's usually something that I'm teaching like a, a course around, but it's um, working with the element of fire to ask fire as a helping spirit to sort of open the way for us to access our own emotional experience, to let those things that we've left buried to emerge a bit intentionally and to share with fire what we're grieving, whether it's something in the future or in the past, like Risha was talking about. And then once we really feel it moving, this might require some like keening, some making noises before you actually feel it moving, some dance like I was talking about, getting some friends who are really easy criers. Um, once you start to feel it moving in your heart, going to this pit in the earth, the sort of earth shrine you create that you then give the grief to. We're literally just like vomiting it up into the earth and making offerings to the earth and thanks for taking that grief and recycling it. And then going back to the fire and just going back and forth as many times as you need to um, in that ritual process. I wish we had more time because I'm very curious about your, you know, use and engagement of, of fire because a lot of traditions, uh, religious traditions, use water, like, you know, in Buddhism. I mean, you know, we have incense, um, but, you know, water is paired with it. And when I was doing end of life care, you know, for um, baptisms or blessings or, you know, just rituals after someone has died, it almost always involved water. Whether it's holy water, whether it's a basin to, you know, collect whatever someone is thinking. So I, I love the fact that you are specifically using fire because that's so unique. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for me, I love water. You know, water is <laughs> Part of my like elemental nature i'm a double pisces <laughs> so, i see you cancer <laughs> yeah <laughs> wonderful yes <laughs> of course <we're> <laughs> <great>. <laughs> um and uh but for me water is like the great reconciler it's so good at helping us to move in these states of surrender these states of dissolution these states of acceptance these states of release as well but fire is this element that helps us to move into the risk necessary for transformation to occur. And when we're in our current contemporary culture, I think the reason fire is often necessary as part of a grief ritual, at least in the way I practice, is because there, it feels like there's such high stakes in being willing to enter into our grief. So sometimes that more deep, soothing, big, holding, almost paternal energy of the water is it still not quite enough for us to choose to risk that expression ourselves? 
beautiful. So there's a question from Sandra. She writes, uh, well, what a magnificent dialogue, thank you. I'm really curious about both of your ideas of salvation incentives and liberation realities. How to understand the work of someone such as Mandala surviving in prison and later in nation building in relation to these terms? So salvation incentives and liberation also realities? Realities. Okay. Yeah, um, that's the thing about these systems and, and what it means in practice, you know? Um, there's a price there. We are meant to recognize the price of liberation. Um, and that price is often our life um, one way or another. So an example if you use it's prison, you know, that's the stripping of life. You know, even if he's alive in this lifetime, there's so much life that he didn't get to live. Um, a biblical example, um, even though I'm Buddhist, would be, uh, what's her name? Um, she walked into, was it Shahar? I don't know. Um, Abraham had a, um, a servant um, who he had a child with. Um, and Sarah, his wife, wasn't able to have a child. So Sarah was being quite cruel to the servant. Um, and the servant left in the middle of the night to the desert and she was going to die. Um, and, you know, that was not fair. She had choice of dying or returning back to the person who was abusing her in a really messed up situation. And an angel appeared and gave her water. And that water was enough to allow her to survive and save her in that moment. But ultimately, she had to go back to her captor. Um, and there wasn't liberation actualized in that moment. And for a lot of us who are, you know, committing to these practices, liberation isn't something that we have the, the it's, it's a, it shouldn't be a privilege, really, it's a right <laughs> to experience in this lifetime. Um, and that is the reality of where we are. And that is one of many things that we have to grieve. Um, there's a question um, about uh, signs of successful grief. Grief. So, how do how do we recognize what successful grieving is and the fulfillment of that? Thanks. Do you want to take this one, or you want to take it together? What are you, what are you thinking? You're nodding. Together. I was like, together. Yeah. No. No. Why, why don't you go first? Yeah. Um, you know, I try not to ascribe terms like successful to the grieving process, just because. I mean, there's no value judgment. Um, the process is what it is. Um, but in terms of recognizing your ability to, to move through it, I think that's a really individual um, individual relationship. Yeah, that I, would, I would echo that, that I think the word success has a lot of, um, just value judgment in it that that can get in the way actually of of being able to engage our grief if we're trying to make sure we're doing it right you know i want to make sure i'm grieving the best that anyone's ever grieved <laughs> but i hear what you're saying too i hear the the need and the question to know like when a culture with so few models for engaging grief in a way that that is wholehearted it's hard to know what that even looks like like what is a model for healthy grieving and so for me at least my experience, how I know that I've really grieved something is the feeling of emptiness actually afterwards. And it's not a good feeling necessarily, that emptiness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, like, it's like there's a way it just scours you out. Like I felt my heart just cracked open afterwards. And um, in those moments though, you be, if from that place of that emptiness, you start to feel this urging of, in my community, we talk about the raw bone of your longing rubbing up against the ache of your destiny. And that sounds like almost abstract and, and, and like lofty words. And what I mean when I say that is just that feeling of like, oh yeah, that's what actually matters to me. There's this what grief just brings in its own system of value judgment that just sweeps all the chess pieces off the playing board and and ask you to start again and, and revalue your life. I wonder if there's more you'd, you'd want to say about your experience of that. 
pretty sure. Yeah, I love that you use the term emptiness because in Buddhism, you know, we talk a lot about um, emptiness as a, a state to aspire towards. Um, and, and emptiness is not to be confused with absence or with lack, right? Um, I think Thich Nhat Hanh uses the example of you know, a cup. It, it's, it's, even though there's nothing in it, when we're looking at it, you know, it's filled with air. Like it's not, it, it's not a void you know, um, so, and, and something can be empty of one thing, but full of another, so it's empty of water, but uh, filled with air, um, so, so emptiness is still something that, that's filled with, um, it's filled with something, right, um, and that something, and, and allowing space for, for that, that emptiness to, to arise and to be experienced, um, is really important when transitioning, um, you know, fear, grief. There's a uh, question from uh, Priscilla. She asks, can you speak to the healing of ancestral grief? Um, That's you, Langston. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so ancestral grief can sometimes present itself as this grief that feels like too big for just one lifetime. Like you're like, oof, like this, sadness I feel or this anger I feel goes so far beyond just me um, and when we encounter that kind of grief of the ancestors one thing I think is useful is to set boundaries with the ancestors to really create this sense of spaciousness remember I'm the living I'm the one with the body you're the ancestor so we, we can be in communication I love you and I don't need to be swimming in your emotions because I need to live my life. So that's one basic first easy quick fix. Not, not necessarily easy, easier than done sometimes, but there's certain um, practices like, like even just asking your well ones, uh, even if you don't know their names, asking the good, true and beautiful ancestors in your line, because if any of us go far enough back, we all have them, the really luminous ones to come in and hold that space for you between you and the un, what I might call the unresolved ancestors that hold these intense emotions so that you can mediate that connection a bit. That's one just really simple, quick fix. And beyond that, actually healing the ancestral grief, I think needs to be done at the level of the ancestors. So there's different ritual practices um, that I would use that are a little more than we can talk about now in this, in this call, but that, um, you can engage to help allow those who are still stuck in those unresolved emotions to receive healing around them. Um, I've also experienced grief uh, of the ancestors, not only of the unresolved, but, but of the well ones, like remorse for actions they've taken in their life that have harmed their descendants. And sometimes for that, the clearing of the grief was really being willing to have enough spaciousness and resource to feel it myself and then choose to take new actions in my life that allowed that same pattern not to happen again. Like men in my line who committed gendered violence towards women, seeing how can I really honor and uphold, you know, if I'm presenting individuals and women in my life to um, not allow myself to be a carrier of that pattern. I just have one last question for both of you. Um, do you believe that there is an end to grief, or if that's something that we would wish for, or is to be alive to be holding grief and to live through that experience? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, I don't think that there is an end to grief. Um, I think that it takes different forms and has different manifestations and different expressions. Um, but absolutely, if, to be alive is to be mortal. <laughs> and if to be mortal it is a state of impermanence, and if we are constantly moving through a state of impermanence, then we are constantly moving through grief, like our own grief in a moment, um, which is often complex and tied to different things, plus the grief that we have inherit, inherited, which, you know, Buddh Buddhism, we call our ancient twisted karma, right? Um, so we are surrounded by and swimming through grief, and it is imperative, it's our, our life's work to 
commit to moving through that grief and transform that grief from suffering into an opportunity and possibility for healing and connection. Next, and you second that? Or? Yeah, yeah, I just want to second everything Brisha said. I think that was beautiful. <laughs> Better note to end on than anything I would add. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you, uh, Brisha Wade and Langston Khan for this illuminating conversation. And I want to thank all of you who joined us today from all over the world. Uh, it's so powerful to be part of these conversations. Uh, and um, I want to remind you, you can uh, purchase uh, Grieving While Black and Deep Liberation from Banyan Books, banyan.com. And we will ship the book out to wherever you are support your local independent bookstores. Um, so thanks again, Brisha Wade and Langston Khan. It's been a real honor to, to be able to host you. Thank you so much, Jacob. And thank you everyone for, for being here. Thank you, Brisha. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.